Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the RIT Innovation Hall of Fame induction ceremony. And I am Bill Destler, president of RIT, and I am a very proud president on this, our Innovation Weekend. Technically, every weekend, in fact, every day at RIT is Innovation Weekend, but this weekend is when we celebrate the incredible energy and innovative spirit found on this campus every day. We begin with today's ceremony and the induction of the fourth class of awe-inspiring innovators. The Innovation Hall of Fame is still fairly new, but already it has demonstrated RIT's substantial connections to innovation in the arts, sciences, and industry. The innovators who are part of the Hall of Fame and those being inducted today are individuals who have impacted the world through a comprehensive body of artistic, creative, or technical work, or through innovative intellectual property, products, technologies, systems designs, or businesses. Each has been recognized regionally, nationally, or internationally in his or her unique contributions to a profession. Innovation takes on many forms. And RIT is proud to celebrate the many different ways in which innovation energizes this educational community. Today we share the concept, we, sorry, today we shine the spotlight on six individuals with deep and meaningful ties to this great university. Individuals who have expanded the body of knowledge in their fields and arguably more important, enriched the educations and lives of RIT students. It is gratifying this year to say that four of the six have served as full-time RIT faculty members, and all six have served as mentors to RIT students or student teams. So in addition to their innovative accomplishments, they have intentionally passed the innovative torch to future RIT generators. There are several people I'd like to welcome to acknowledge but first of all, I am grateful for the support of our professional sign language interpreters without whom this event could not possibly be fully inclusive. Thank you. Let's give them a hand. And I also want to welcome the Honorable Joseph Robach, New York State Senator and my personal friend representing the 56th Senate District and a strong supportive of innovation initiatives in Western New York. Joe, stand up and take a bow. In addition, we have Wendell Castle, Jim DeCaro, and John Hamilton, all distinguished members of the inaugural Innovation Hall of Fame class of 2010, with us this evening to welcome the innovators of 2013 into the fold. Would you please stand up and be recognized? And finally, I want to thank the members of the two committees who sought and selected the people you see honored tonight. First, this year's nominating committee narrowed the hundreds of nominations down to a select pool of candidates. That committee included John Shull, Gary Bain, Michael Ruling, Elizabeth Perry, Andreas Savakis, Emerson Fullwood, and Ken Reed. Would you please stand and be recognized? And that committee handed the nominations off to the selection committee, which had a very hard job of picking amongst the wonderfully worthy candidates. And the selection committee included Lorraine Justice, Andrew Sears, Barry Culhane, Brian O'Shaughnessy, Dean Kamen, Susan Holliday, Andrew Brenneman, D.T. Ogilvy, Kelly Redder. And would those individuals please stand up and be recognized? Both of these committees were chaired by the director of RIT Simone Center for Student Innovation and Entrepreneurship, Dr. Richard DiMartino. I ask that you join me in thanking the members of our two committees who chose this outstanding class of innovators before you today, and thanks very much, Richard, for your leadership. As I said at the outset, today's induction is a gateway to a weekend of innovation on campus. Tomorrow, we will host our sixth Imagine RIT Festival, a truly amazing day that showcases the talent, creativity, and spirit of innovation in the RIT family. 
And by the way, you know, we've had six of these things, and it has rained a total of 15 minutes. That's pretty amazing. During the festival, we will bring our class of 2013 innovators together for a panel discussion on the intersection of engineering, commerce, science, art, and innovation. RIT Provost Jeremy Hafner will be moderating that discussion. Today, Dr. Hafner has another role, MC, for this ceremony. While the university at large lays claim to fostering innovation, I can think of no person more committed to making innovation an integral part of every student's education here at RIT. Please welcome Dr. Hafner to begin our celebration of the class of 2013. Jeremy? Thank you, Bill. And before I begin, I want to acknowledge another alumna of our Innovation Hall of Fame. Patty Moore has joined us. She is the recipient from 2012. Patty, would you please stand up and be recognized as well? Well, it truly is an honor to join you today and recognize the unique accomplishments of these individuals. As President Dessler said, I am passionate about fostering innovation on the RIT campus, but this passion is not mine alone. It is shared by our students who embrace discovery and pursue new knowledge with creativity and a no barrier spirit, spirit rarely seen in young people elsewhere today. It is also shared by the RIT faculty members who support those students spurring them to deeper understanding of their academic areas and always encourage them, encouraging them to ask why, or perhaps just as often, why not? At RIT, we strive to foster innovation in every area of our campus, from classrooms to labs to research centers. It's evident that students are encouraged to find new solutions take different paths, and to look at things from a different point of view. In fact, this evening's uh, ceremony also brings a little flavor of innovation because uh, this is the first time we've actually held it in a spot where the audience members could sit down. So we think that's quite an innovation. Next year, we'll find a place where it's air conditioned. How's that sound? <laughs> to support those traditional academic venues and kick innovation into high gear, RIT has built an innovation ecosystem that connects all the colleges and fields of study through cross-disciplinary projects, inspiring speakers and visiting professors, and an array of other opportunities to enrich every student's studies. The outcomes of many of, their, of these opportunities will be on display tomorrow at the festival. And of course, today's celebration of these extraordinary innovators plays an important role in showing what innovation as a life pursuit means. While innovation is all around the campus, selecting the individuals to, to induct into the Hall of Fame is not so easy. Now, if you watch the Academy Awards show, you know this is where they bring out the accountants to tell you how the winners were selected. But um, our accountants are very busy today, no doubt checking how the provost spends his money. So rather, I will give you an idea of what goes on in the final selection. Nominations come from RIT alumni, faculty, staff, past and current administrators, corporate partners, just about anyone who is closely connected to the university and wants to recognize the work of an innovative individual with strong ties to RIT. After a thorough review by our nomination committee, a slate of candidates is presented to the selection committee. And the selection committee digs deep into the history of the individual's work and assesses the breadth of the impact of the nominee's creations. This committee strives to build a class of innovators that represents the nature of innovation at RIT, diverse perspective, representative of technology, the arts, science, and business, and always, always game-changing. So, now, let's get on to the fun part of the program and the part that we've been waiting for. I'm very pleased to introduce the first member of the class of 2013 is Dr. Lynn Fuller. When the history of microelectronic engineering is written, 
there will be a very long chapter devoted to Lynn Fuller. Dr. Fuller is an RIT alumnus from the class of 1970. And by the way, if you're passing by Clark Gym, take a look at the Athletic Hall of Fame where you will see Lynn's picture there as well. He joined the electrical engineering faculty and made RIT's first transistors in 1978, teaching a senior level professional elective course in semiconductor devices. That course and Dr. Fuller's dedication led to the launch of RIT's program in microelectronic engineering. And at the time, no other university in the world had attempted to educate undergraduate students in the area of microelectronics. Dr. Dr. Fuller had founding responsibility for the development of the program, funding and creation of the laboratory facility and development of the graduate programs in microelectronics, including the creation of the RIT Microsystems PhD program. The microelectronic en uh, engineering program now has over 1,000 alumni working in the semiconductor industry worldwide. The program has become nationally and indeed internationally recognized for excellence in microelectronics, as has Dr. Fuller. We have a wonderful video now for you to watch and enjoy. When I first came to RIT, we had no transistors. There weren't any. I think I remember when RIT got its first transistor. Now we have cell phones with billions and billions of transistors in them, and things have changed just incredibly. The integrated circuit was created in the 1960s, and by 1970, there was a rapid growth with the creation of the microprocessor. And by 1980, it was a full-blown, multi-hundred billion dollar industry. And the universities had fallen behind in creating the engineers that industry needed. I started at RIT as an electrical engineering student before there was a microelectronic engineering program. Dr. Fuller put together some equipment for making integrated circuits. And he said that a friend of mine and I could come in and do whatever we wanted as long as we wrote it down. We made the first solar cells at RIT, the first photo masks, the first uh, transistors and resistors, and it was really, really exciting. And later, the notes that we had done for that course were what laid the groundwork for the microelectronic engineering program. The industry needed uh, these engineers and they came to RIT um, because RIT had imaging science, but they wanted an engineer that understood the electrical engineering aspects of um, microelectronic engineering as well. And no such program existed. We had to create an entirely new program with more than a dozen courses. And we also had to create a laboratory that was huge. We had to build a new building, raise money, put in $50 million worth of equipment. Lynn was the person that was at the right place at the right time. But more than that, he was the right person at the right place in the right time. As a faculty member that was also an alum, I think he knew a lot of people here. So when an opportunity came to start a unique program, he could sit down and talk to the various players that needed to come to the table to put this all together. I think innovation can both be inspirational and very methodical. In the case of uh, semiconductors in microelectronic engineering, it's more of the methodical side. We have to put together a billion things at the size of an atom, and they all have to be right. If there's one mistake, the circuit doesn't work. In our laboratories, we actually make semiconductors with thousands of transistors. Our processes are very similar to what they do in industry. The integrated circuits that we make are pretty sophisticated and pretty amazing to make at the university. I think one of the most innovative things that Lynn brought to the program was just the concept that you can teach very high level material and concepts to undergraduate students. We have a class and it's uh, a lot of hands-on interpersonal work. 
dispersed throughout the clean room are all these teams working on different pieces of equipment and he then moves between the groups dispensing <laughs> wisdom and information on whether they're doing things right or wrong and that's not a normal way to teach a class and these are the kind of things that when these students get out and go to work in industry it's that experience that makes all the difference. <laughs> the other day in class I was talking to my students about how long I've been there. I like to tell them that I came to RIT before RIT was here. Uh, there were no buildings here when I came to RIT. It was just a swamp out here. And then one of the students pops up her hand and says, my dad was your student. And there's, and that's interesting. Lynn's career at RIT has spanned a, a tremendous length of time. And so Lynn's perspective is, is invaluable. He can remind the students of where we've been and where we're going. Our program was unique and I've seen other schools copy our program or at least try to do something similar to what we do and that's also very gratifying. And today I think we made a real impact in changing the way education is done uh, for engineers that end up working in the semiconductor industry and I believe that it's helped uh, the industry, uh, not just RIT. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Lynn Fuller. I'm greatly honored to have been selected to the RIT Innovation Hall of Fame, and I'd like to say thank you. And I'd like to also congratulate the other recipients that are going to be honored uh, later tonight. I'd like to thank my family um, for all their support over the years. Uh, my wife is here and my two daughters and their families, and especially my grandchildren, Olenka, Diana, Ian, Oliver, and Griffin. I spend many, many hours at home working on RIT-related things and don't always get time to teach them or work with them on what they need. And I think they have actually enjoyed uh, working with snap circuits and uh, learning Morse code and whatever it was. So <clears throat> I've also had the opportunity to work and learn with thousands of students at RIT. And two of the best of them are here. Uh, Dr. Robert Pearson, who was featured in this film, is here. Uh, he was the, one of the first faculty in the microelectronic engineering program. And uh, Dr. Ivan Puchadas, who was one of my first students in uh, the microsystems PhD program. And I hope they will carry on uh, with the innovation in the future. This particular area of microelectronic engineering for the last 40 years has moved very fast, has been very interesting, and I think it will continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn, and congratulations. Our next inductee is Jackie Pencari. At RIT, we have a number of faculty who can tell us how light behaves. But Jackie prefers to show us. She is a glass artist whose fascinating work goes beyond creating beauty with glass. She merges glass and science and nature and the human experience to create her works. Jackie works out of a studio near Alfred, New York, but has been an associate of RIT's School for American Crafts for some time. She has a collaborative exhibit in the Student Innovation Hall, mounted especially for tomorrow's festival. And I genuinely invite you to go down and take a look at that uh, tomorrow, and particularly when the light strikes it at different angles. It's absolutely gorgeous. She has served RIT students as a visiting critique, 
three years as an artist in residence and three years as a visiting artist. In all these cases, sharing her unique perspectives and helping students to hone new skills as glass artists. Let's watch the video. Glass is, it's about the moment. And I know when I'm creating my work that if I have that moment where I go, oh, wow, you know, that's, that's cool, that's really neat, I know that I'm getting somewhere, or I know that I've got it. What makes her and her work innovative is her openness to different kinds of inspiration and research and processes. And so what that does is it makes her work more accessible, I think, to the general public because she is keeping in mind an audience that's wider than the art world. It's the properties of glass that I'm really interested. It's, it's the physics of the glass. It's the moment where maybe you see a, a little bubble in the glass and that bubble, it's beautiful. And when you put light through that, all of a sudden you're, you're seeing something about the glass that was, in essence, invisible. I think that's one of the things that makes her and her work so special, is that she doesn't stay within any boundaries as far as the expected or the normal, traditional glassworking processes. I'm really interested in natural phenomenon. I love to go on walks. I love to take pictures. I have probably 24,000 images now, and that's, it's really inspirational for me to take that information, bring it into the studio. Jackie's inspiration often comes from the most seemingly mundane things or occurrences that most people would just walk right by, like the way water droplets form on a windshield and move upwards rather than down, and that would lead to a whole piece. So she invites you in to share her sense of wonder at it. Some of Jackie's projects, she's starting with traditional glass processes, but she's taking it in new directions, like some of her reflective hemispheres. She'll put in a central piece to make patterns in the glass, but she's brought it to a new place by celebrating the optical potential of that combination of this pattern with the silvered bowl. She's taking something very old and very new and presenting it in a new way. First I go into the hot shop and I create the work. So then I take all of that work back to the studio and that's when the fun begins because it is, it's like a laboratory. It's, it's, I'm experimenting, I'm making discoveries. It's about having these objects and putting them together and playing and um, discovering new things. And the thing about glass is really it's, it's, the material is alive. And so I'm, in a, in a sense, I'm really trying to bring out the best qualities of the material. I think she really thrives off that energy that comes from being surrounded by her ideas. I don't throw anything away. You know, I tell students all the time, don't throw anything out because you may find that that is your best piece and you just don't know why yet. The School for American Crafts has evolved, and what we've done all along is bring in the best makers and thinkers who specialize in various materials and traditional techniques, but not in a way that is just to preserve those traditions, but really to use them as a foundation for innovating, for doing new things with these processes, these techniques, these materials, see what can be done. I think that innovation is about taking away all preconceived ideas nice. about something and taking it in a new direction. She has this way of being able to take these small moments and transform them into powerful pieces of art. And in that way, other people get to be in her 
brain and get to experience life the way she does, which is a wonderful place to be. My hope is that when somebody is looking at my work, that they get the same kind of experience that I do in the making of the work, to sort of have that moment of aha or awe. Ladies and gentlemen, Jackie Pencare, Innovation Hall of Fame inductee for 2013. Thank you so much. I am thrilled to receive this recognition and especially proud to be associated with Rochester Institute of Technology. And I want to thank John Scholl for nominating me and the committee for choosing me. Um, and also I'd like to thank Robin Cass, Michael Rogers, and David Schnuckel and the students in the glass department for all their help. Um, previous, uh, for this current work now and for previous work that I've done. And of course I'd like to thank my family. And this honor has really been an inspiration for me and really just the right kind of medicine I need right now. Jackie, it's safe to say that your work and the work that you do here at RIT is an inspiration for all of us, so thank you so much. And now we're pleased to induct Paul L. Taylor III. Paul is an innovator who quite literally helped to change the life experiences of deaf and hard of hearing people. Paul saw an opportunity to combine Western Union teletypewriters with modems to create the first telecommunication devices for the deaf, known as TDDs or TTYs. But he didn't stop there. He then helped to create a network of these devices, as well as using them to launch local telephone wake-up services for the deaf and the nation's first telephone relay system for the deaf, which he expanded to a statewide system. RIT was fortunate to welcome Paul as chair of the engineering support team at the National Technical Institute for the Deaf in 1975. And he remained on our faculty for 30 years, continuing to innovate and advocate in telecommunications for the deaf. Ladies and gentlemen, excuse me, but let's watch the video first. In 1964, when I saw the picture phone at the New York World's Fair, I could see the solution coming. It just blew my mind. It just hit me that I could communicate on a wire. I remember very well. Paul was always just a dreamer. He was always thinking about new ideas. One of his most frustrating times was when he was not able to use the telephone. All my life, I had never used the telephone. I had always asked my mother, my high school friends, and other people who knew me well if they would mind making a phone call. I would write out the number for them and they would do me a favor. One problem that I had with that it doesn't look very good to call a girl through your mom and ask for a date. But I could see problems in the future as well. For example, if I'm in employment and people want to call me, people want to work on something together over the phone, how would that work? 
he came across a good friend of ours from California who had invented a technology that would allow us to use old teletypes that would fit with a modem. And that way we could use the telephone lines and the telephone system. He said he would be able to send me the acoustic converter and that would allow me to change the wiring in my TTY. I went into the basement, took the thing apart, and made some adjustments, put it back together, and then he suggested that I call him at his number. So I dialed, and he answered immediately. Hello, go ahead. It was an exciting moment. To be able to communicate directly to California for the first time. His response was instantaneous. We were able to talk back and forth. And people started coming to my home to see this machine in action. They were astounded. It made me think the entire deaf community could be connected like this throughout the entire country. And he was able to network with the telephone companies and be able to talk with different people. I think that the idea of him establishing the TTY network was not only for communicating between two deaf people, but the other part was he really wanted to establish an answering service, the relay service so that he could be able to contact people who were not deaf. And I believe that that really helped deaf people to become more functional and much more independent in their professional lives. NTID had heard about me and the work I was doing. They knew I had an engineering degree and they offered me a position to come and work with them. Paul is probably one of the few out of a handful of deaf people who have achieved their professional engineering license. That was one of the reasons why we really wanted him to come to NTID at RIT, and we felt that he could make a huge impact on the lives of young people. Slowly, the TTYs became less and less mechanical and more and more electronic. It became smaller and smaller, which was wonderful. Then eventually, with today's technologies, uh, with mobile phones, FaceTime, video phones, all of that, you know, I think Paul can sit back and be proud that he was one of the pioneers that made it possible for us to have everything that we have now. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Taylor. I am very honored to be considered part of RIT's Innovative Hall of Fame. At the same time, I feel very humbled because I did not do this alone. Before I continue, I want to give you a sign. The sign for innovation is you 
form the, the sh hand shape of the four. So maybe you come up with eight ideas, and then you innovate something. So this is a sign for innovation. You're using your imagination, you're thinking, you're innovating, you're coming up, you're creating. And so I want to see all of you in the audience. Copy me, please. Innovation. Great. Thank you. As the film pointed out, I was at the 1964 New York World's Fair where Sally and I were sitting down apart from each other. And it was the first time in our lives that we were able to communicate from different rooms. It had never happened before. And so after that, I just talked about that all the time with other people. There's a few people I'd like to thank. I know that I only have 90 seconds, but I'd like to start with just a few important people that helped me along the way. I want to thank my father-in-law. He's 101 years old, still living. He heard me talk about the picture phone that I had seen at the World's Fair. And I would talk about it again and again. So he just happened to know several people in the management of Western Union, the teletype company. So he got to thinking, I'll call my friend and see what they could do to help. Myself and Sally realized that we could communicate in this way over the wire. So he contacted Western Union, and they said, oh, we have many, many old teletypes from World War II. They were just stacked up. And they said that they would like to see these devices put to good use. The second person I'd like to thank is the inventor. There's that sign, the inventor of the acoustic converter. He knew that the teletype device at that time, quite some time ago, used private lines. They were not hooked up to the audio part of the phone network. And so he figured a way how to combine the talking, the audio, with the teletype technology. And he came up with an idea. Every time you hit a key, it would send pulses. And each pulse was different depending upon which key you hit. And the pulses would be converted to sound. And then in turn, on the other end of the line, the receiver would receive that sound and convert it to the exact same electronic pulse that the person who originated the, the, sent, the signal sent. So that made this possible for people to use the phone, for deaf people to use the phone network. Another person I'd like to thank is my lifelong good and strong friend. He was a very good mechanic. He got into the teletype business with me way back when, back in 1965. And we both went to school to learn how to work on the teletype devices, how to make the adjustments to change the wiring configuration. So we learned a great deal together. And then we were ready to make the connection to the coupler. 
And so he was with me throughout that time. And he knew many, many things that I didn't know, so he was extremely helpful. My friend's name is Gene McDowell. We both lived together in St. Louis, Missouri, back at that time. Another group I'd like to thank is the deaf community located in St. Louis, Missouri. The deaf community there saw what myself and Jean were doing, and they were amazed. They said, oh, you can take this phone and put it on the coupler and type. I'd, I demonstrated, hi, Jean, how are you? And then Jean would respond, I'm fine. And I mean that it blew all of these deaf people's minds. You know, the first time they saw the possibility of communicating from one house to another house where they didn't have to drive over to their friend's house to knock on the door, ring doorbells, and, and meet them. They didn't have to do that anymore. They could communicate from home, from house to house, using the phone network. And the last person I want to thank, you saw her face in the movie, my dear wife, Sally. Sally, please stand up and be recognized. Sally, are you here? Sally did a lot of the paperwork for me. And when we developed the teletype repair manual for the deaf, it was a much easier version than what was available at the time. It, the old version was quite complex, so we made modifications to make it accessible to the deaf community. We used a lot of visuals, a lot of photographs with some captions, so it was much easier to comprehend with the English subtitles and, or captions. And so Sally organized some of the work. We had these girls coming over to type the captions to help, and so every time Western Union or AT&T would release teletypes, we would have to sign the necessary paperwork for obvious reasons. And Sally took care of all of that for me. I'm not a paperwork type of man, so thank you, Sally, for all you did. You were a tremendous asset. And she gave me a lot of inspiration through the years. And after 45 years, I was tired, but she said, one more step. Keep going, one more step. So thank you, Sally. So thank you so much for this honor, and I will cherish this all my life. Thank you, all of you, for coming out. One more time. <laughs> right? right? One more time with the innovation sign. I'm glad he did it because I was going to do it one more time for you. I uh, share a little story that I uh, had a conversation with Paul before this event. I was talking to him and I was struck by his eyeglasses because they're they're stunning. And I I made a comment that I thought his eyeglasses were wonderful. And he then proceeded to tell me what his next invention is going to be because he's going to take the Google glasses, which is the new invention from Google that puts the in computer interface right there in your, uh, front of your eyeglasses and do the same kind of invention that he did for us through the TTY. So, Paul, again, thank you so much for your wonderful innovations and the spirit that you bring to RIT. Thank you. Next up is entrepreneur and RIT alumnus of our computer science program, Robert Fabio. Bob is not just a successful entrepreneur, he's a visionary entrepreneur. When he launches a startup, 
which he has done many times in the last 30 years or so, he's usually looking to change the entire industry in which he's working. He did it in 1979 when he launched Tivoli Systems, an enterprise computer management system, when there was no such thing as an enterprise computer management system. He did it again in launching Dazzle Corporation. He became so adept at launching world-class innovative businesses that he was awarded the Ernst and Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 1997. Currently, he is innovating in an industry so, so sorely in need of new approaches. His latest venture, White Glove House Call Health, stands to revolutionize the way healthcare is delivered to the consumer. Bob shares his entrepreneurial experience and perspectives on business innovation to our students in numerous ways, including speaking at our annual entrepreneur conference and mentoring student entrepreneur teams. Let's enjoy the video for Bob Fabio. Disruptive innovation is about bringing innovation to a market uh, in an unexpected way that ultimately creates new markets, new categories, new products, new solutions that completely disrupt the, the, the fabric of the industry. It's generally the case that uh, disruptive innovators attack an existing player. When we started Tivoli, we were this teeny little company in Austin, Texas, and we were competing against IBM and at the time AT&T and HP and Sun and all these gigantic computer manufacturers. And they said, you can't compete against those guys. How are you going to ever win? It's the opportunity to create something that is significantly better than what's being delivered today. And in Bob's case, it's always game changing. Mainframe computers were the predominant backbone in corporate America. Networks of computers were beginning to emerge. And I said, well, why can't we manage a network of computers like a mainframe and do it with a graphical user interface? And people went, huh? Um, but, but that idea, that germ of an idea, created the third or fourth largest software category in the world today. A big idea or an industry transforming innovation is what gets an entrepreneur uh, excited. And White Glove Health was based on Bob's passion for uh, developing an alternative healthcare delivery system. I get up to go to the doctor's office. I leave the house at quarter to nine. Um, you know, get through all the traffic downtown, struggle to find parking, go sit in the waiting room, fill out the clipboard of forms, wait some more, the whole nine yards, right? End up going to the diagnostic lab, the pharmacy, the grocery store, and now it's 2.15 in the afternoon. And I went, oh my word. It's healthcare attacking the, one of the largest, messiest markets on the planet, complex subject matter, and there's umpteen things that I could do w differently with the experience I had today with technology. I said, I've got it. I'm gonna find a way to deliver everything to the consumer, the care, the meds, the foods, the beverages, the over-the-counters, and do it in an affordable way. And any of us who are entrepreneurs, see the huge waste in healthcare. So uh, someone like Bob couldn't help but uh, think that he could find a, a better solution. Today, we use our insurance from sore throats to sinus infections to knee replacements. Um, but that's like buying car insurance for oil changes. We don't do that. But what we did is we invented a membership-based business where if you want care brought to you, you join. Just like you do Costco's or a gym and you pay a flat fixed fee and then you have unlimited use of the White Glove healthcare system. If you think of the heart of innovation as solving problems, it's definitely true for Bob. And Bob was successful in growing that company 600% in three years. I've been bombarded 
and, and the company is bombarded with individual feedback from people about how we've changed their lives, their work, their families, the fact that they're, they're receiving health care maybe for the first time in their lives where someone actually um, focused on the customer experience. The ideas that uh, I've had have ultimately created over a billion and a half dollars of shareholder value at time of exit. That, uh, that's hard for me to believe, but it's true. But when you sit back and you look at the, the, the businesses that have been built and the, all the jobs that were created and the, the wages that were you know, paid um, and the families that were fed, et cetera, et cetera, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. I gravitate to ventures um, that are big ideas, that are very disruptive, that solve a big market need um, where there's the potential to make lots of money. When I asked him uh, which of his ventures was his favorite, his answer to me was the next one. Innovation is something that's a change agent. It's something that when really bright people get in a room, they go, wow, that's brilliant. No one else on the planet has ever thought of it. Um, and it is something that creates new markets, uh, creates new categories in, in, in industries. And so to me, that's what innovation is about. A warm welcome for Robert Fabio. Good evening or good afternoon to everyone. It's uh, truly an honor to be recognized by RIT. Um, as I've said repeatedly over the last few weeks in talking about this, I'm humbled um, to be in such great company this evening. So congratulations to everybody. Um, I never imagined when I attended RIT back in the mid 80s uh, to obtain a master's degree in computer science that I'd be standing here this evening since graduating in 1985, I'm flattered to say that I've formed relationships with the last two presidents of RIT. I've served as a board of trustee member. I've spoken to many students, faculty members, and board of trustee members on multiple occasions about entrepreneurship and innovation, and now inducted in the RIT Innovation Hall of Fame. I've been asked, how did RIT shape uh, me as an innovator? And the answer jumped quickly to me, it was simple and clear. While RIT taught me many things as a student, the most important was to take risks. You can't innovate without taking risks. As a young man completing my master's degree, I took a big risk uh, by seeking permission from RIT to use software that I had developed in my master's thesis in a commercial setting. While I knew that at that time, that was generally not allowed, I asked anyways. I was told I was the first student to be ever granted the permission to use software from RIT out of a thesis project in a commercial setting. And ultimately, that became a critical piece of innovation for a Massachusetts startup that I worked for that then went public. So RIT, RIT taught me a very valuable lesson in my formative years, that nothing ventured, nothing gained. In the end, for me, to innovate is core to who I am. With every business I've been a part of, the most exciting aspect of it is finding novel, innovative ways to solve problems, problems that others may have looked at but hadn't seen the same kind of solution. In closing, it's rare for my family uh, to enjoy the fruits of my labor or the professional compliments that have come, that have come my way. Uh, so it's special for me to have my family here tonight. Um, thank you very much for your support and your presence here this evening. And thank you again for this unexpected acknowledgement.
Once again, congratulations, Bob. We're glad to count you as one of our own and proud of the work that you're doing to change the healthcare system for the good. Next, we present Dr. Bruce Smith. Bruce is an RAT alumnus as well and professor of nanolithography. Between student years and faculty years, he has been a member of the RIT, RIT community for over 35 years. Bruce is the director of the Microsystems Engineering PhD program in the Kate Gleason College of Engineering and the founder of a semiconductor R&D equipment company in Rochester, Amphibian Systems, with over, sorry, <laughs> with over $6 million in sales and contracts with companies in the US, Asia, and Europe. A prolific inventor, Bruce holds 27 patents with 24 issued in the United States, two from Japan and one from Europe, all in the fields of optics, microelectronics, and nanolithography. He, is, he also has two US patents pending, one with 131 other inventions referencing it, a good indicator that, of its importance in the field. His technical Advances in nanolithography have made an impact on the way that semiconductor devices are now made, which has in turn changed the way many of us live our lives every day. Let's watch the video. Microlithography is an integral part of building a microchip, which is in your computers, your iPhone, your camera, and so forth. That's what provides the functionality for your electronics. And microlithography is what does all the patterning, what does all the creation of those small, tiny features within those devices. The word lithography means patterning, so microlithography means doing this really small. Microlithography generally means maybe on the micron scale, splitting a meter a million times. Nanolithography is splitting it another thousand times more than that. He practically wrote the book. I guess he did write the book on microlithography, science and technology. Bruce's work has been uh, trying to make those lines smaller and smaller and smaller and developing the techniques and the materials to enable that. There is some limitation to just how small you can make the features that are in, that are in your microchip and you're going to hit the limits of physics, the limits of how small you can optically make something. Well, one way to extend that is start using wavelengths that are shorter than optical heading towards the X-ray. Extreme ultraviolet lithography, often we call EUV, is actually part of the X-ray spectrum, using X-ray wavelengths, X-ray light, uh, in order to produce very small features. One of the things that makes Bruce an innovator is his ability to look, look ahead, not just look at where the industry is today. You know, if UV is not good enough, I think I'm going to work on deep UV materials. And deep UV isn't good enough. You know what, I'm gonna, you know, if air's not good enough, let, let's work on immersion lithography. Well, water immersion lithography is something that my students and I have worked on for a long time now, about uh, 12 years or so, where we use fluids, in this case we use water, as an imaging media to extend the uh, resolution capability of patterning. And now immersion lithography, as we first envisioned it, is employed in every semiconductor process, high-end semiconductor process in the world. Bruce was able to demonstrate a tool that could uh, produce these kinds of small line which using immersion lithography which was much uh, less expensive than say any commercial manufacturer. Uh, it was such an innovative idea that he then uh, went ahead and patented the idea and uh, established a commercial venture which I'm proud to say actually got its start out in our venture creations incubator. RIT, in that sort of way, just historically what we've been for many, many, many decades, has been a great place for innovation, for coming up with solutions to problems. In the past, there have been uh, fairly large leaps in technology. Uh, what we're doing more now is looking at subtle uh, differences, small changes that will still have enough impact to allow uh, the industry to make continual advances. The best way to move any technology forward is not through revolution, it's through evolution. Just small amounts of latitude, a percent or a fraction of a percent, 
being able to make that much improvement doesn't sound like a lot, but that could be enough to really change uh, the way that you're able to do something. Well, I think RIT is a, is a great place to drive innovation and invention as well. And it comes down to what RIT has traditionally been for a long time, and that's a university of applied practice, applied engineering in the engineering field. Because what we do with our students is we force them to think about how things work and do it themselves. And we spend a lot of time with our students in the lab, hands-on kind of experience. And to see the impact that they are making, they've become key players in this field. I mean, it's not that he's training students to be great on day one. He's really training them to be great on day 101 and 1,001 and 10,001. I consider myself really quite lucky in that what I do and what I love to do and what I love to work with students on happens to be needed today and over the past 10 or 15 years, the things that we have done have been needed in this semiconductor industry. If we look at today's technology, it's, uh, it's inspiring to see what it is we can hold today that we couldn't have even imagined a few years ago. And it certainly has been uh, uh, a, a lot of fun to be involved in the innovation that's, that has taken us this far to where we are today. And there will be something for the next generation and generations after that. So I think there's plenty of room for young students and new students and students for many generations to come to be involved in new innovations that we, we can't imagine today. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Bruce Smith. good video. It's the first time, first time we get to see that. Well, um, I want to thank everyone, and, and I did write down a few remarks. I know I've got to keep this brief. My parents are here today, and also with my wife as well, and I'm real grateful that they could attend, although I can't quite see you up there. Uh, I've been fortunate to have entered the semiconductor industry in the early 80s, starting my career in Silicon Valley, San Jose, California, with my lovely wife, at the time when the industry was still rather young with a lot of innovation on the horizon, pushing technology to where it is today. And in the course of the past 30 or so years, I've been grateful to have contributed to this innovation, especially in the field that I'm involved in, in microlithography. Uh, there have been many individuals along the way all over the world that I've been fortunate to work to have worked with. In the, in the many years I've been at RIT, this has been an exceptional place, an exceptional environment to support such innovation and creativity. Now, I mentioned my parents are here today. My dad uh, is also an RIT alumna, as am I. And it's also my father's birthday today, May 3rd. So I'd like to... So I'd like to wish him a happy birthday, and I kept these comments very brief because I know we've got 10 seconds to sing him happy birthday, right? <laughs> I'll start. His name is Bruce. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Bruce. Happy birthday to you. Bruce, congratulations. We're pleased to welcome another RIT graduate and faculty member to our Hall of Fame. And that brings us to our final inductee for 2013, Dr. John Schott. John is the Frederick and Anna B. Weedman Professor in RIT's Chester F. Carlson Center for Imaging Science. He has been a respected member of RIT's faculty since 1981. His early work at RIT laid the cornerstone for the university's imaging science program, where he has been, lead he has been a leading researcher, educator, and mentor of students for decades. From this post, 
John has also been a part of NASA's Landsat science team and the founding director of the Digital Imaging and Remote Sensing Laboratory at RIT. Please join me in watching the video. Imaging science is a really big field. And then remote sensing is sort of a subset of that. It's the images of the Earth from aerial and satellite systems. So Google Earth, and everything, you know, everybody knows remote sensing now because everybody's seen Google Earth, that's a piece of it. But it's typically more the quantitative extraction of information. How clear is the water? How healthy is the vegetation? This is the kind of stuff that we're more focused on. I started here in the uh, what was then called the Photographic Science Department. And by the mid-80s, when the, the center was formed, uh, it was clear that, that there was gonna be a sea change in how we did imaging, but also there was a big push uh, to do research. He was one of the early people that recognized that an active program in research was a vital element in his teaching. If a faculty member is doing cutting edge research, and he has students that are involved in that research. And they then, after graduation, take a job in industry. That's a direct technology transfer. The fact that I'm training remote sensors who are trained in imaging means that they're trained in optics, they're trained in uh, linear systems, the mathematics of images. And all I have to do is sort of put the frosting on the cake and they end up being world-class remote sensors. He works very effectively with students because he, he is viewed by them as their mentor. He's not viewed as a boss. And I think John works the same way across collaborative lines with industry. One of the things that we've done here, and, and everything I've done is a we've done, but it's a, a simulation modeling tool called DeerSig. And what that model does is it lets you see the world as a new sensor would see it, uh, long before you build the sensor and long before we should start bending tin and building billions of dollars of systems. And so this tool is a tool that was conceived of here at RIT and built here at RIT and is now used by aerospace companies and the government uh, all over the country to try and address these problems. Landsat is the longest continuously running program to look at the Earth from space. The value of Landsat is not just the individual scales, but this time history. So we've now got 40 plus years of images that we can not only look at as pictures, but we can quantify. So the foresters got all excited. They could see and map all kinds of neat new things in the forests. The agricultural community could see all sorts of things in terms of what was growing where, how much was growing. The geologists could see all sorts of landforms and map landforms that they had never thought of. The people looking at the, the glaciers could see things that they had never had a chance to see before. The water guys, I'm a water guy, the water people could see all sorts of things happening in uh, the water that we had never been able to see at these kinds of scales. I want to build the tools for all these other guys to use. And so Landsat gave us this huge challenge of, of how do you do that? Three, two, one, zero, have ignition, and lift off of the Atlas V rocket on the Landsat Data Continuity Mission. Landsat 8 was launched uh, in February of 13. It was actually a spectacular sight. It was a beautiful, uh, sunny, clear sky, blue skies in the background. And it uses a new technology. It scans the Earth like you're sweeping up data with a push boom. You push these big lines of sensors as the satellite moves down the face of the Earth. What's exciting about this new technology is that these new instruments will let us be able to decipher much more subtle variations in the world in general, for my purposes, in the water in particular. The ability to work with, with students let you do far more than you can do on your own. They look at problems differently, they attack problems differently. You get them started and uh, nudge them a little bit and then you grab their coattails and let them take you for a ride. He's like the director of an orchestra. 
He recognizes what the flute section has got to do. He recognizes what the violins have to do. And he's able to bring those together in a, in a collaborative context and yet provide the leadership for that. I like solving problems. It's really that simple. Trying to, to solve a problem for somebody, trying to figure out something that someone doesn't know is just fun. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. John Schott, a 2013 inductee for the Innovation Hall of Fame. It's uh, humbling to be in this uh, rather august company. Some of you know I'm not often humbled. Uh, I, 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 I'd like to begin by going off script and uh, thanking Ed for his, uh, his generous input to the video. And I think on behalf of uh, all six of us, uh, thanking the team that put the videos together. It's the first time we've seen them. They're very enjoyable. And I'd also like to thank the people, uh, at least the ones I'm aware of, who were involved in my nomination. Uh, Debbie Standardi, who's been my ally in a number of projects over the years, and, uh, and Al Simone for his, uh, his generous words. Back to my script. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton wrote that perhaps we were able to see farther, he was able to see farther, because he was standing on the shoulders of the giants of science who came before him. This notion of building on work of our predecessors has become an axiom of modern science. In my case, I've had a small army of young men and women who hauled me up on those giant shoulders, propped me up there, and pointed the way for me to look. To be honest, some of them aren't so young. I was reminded of that the last two days where I sat in Washington and watched four of my former students brief some of the most senior people in the intelligence community about the work they were planning on doing with your tax dollars. All, all four of them were Air Force colonels, and many of them had hair the color of mine. Anyways, I owe the honor you grant me today to the efforts of these students who have worked closely with me. They dragged me up on those giant shoulders, propped me there, pointed the direction, showed me where to look and what to look for. There are many other colleagues, secretaries, even a few administrators, who but for time I'd like to acknowledge. <laughs> However, there is one other young lady who I'd particularly like to thank. She propped me up, often told me where to look and what to do. My partner for many decades, Pam Schott. May she stay forever young like these young men are in my vision. Thank you. Congratulations, John. All of our innovators, I think you'll agree, represent the model of a teacher scholar who makes sure that whatever they do, they, they pass along their knowledge to the next generation. I think we can be a proud of all of these inductees. And I hope you have found that the work of these innovators as inspiring as I have. The entire RIT community is so proud to have individuals of this caliber working amongst us. Please join me in a round of applause one more time for all of our class of 2013 innovators. And if you all would please stand for the recognition. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to our close. I invite you all to join us for a lovely reception in the University Gallery immediately following this ceremony. There are staff members uh, here to help direct you to the gallery, which is on the second floor and to the left of where we are right now. And please, please come back tomorrow 
for the Imagine RIT Festival, where you'll see inspired work of our students and faculty, the next generation of our inventors. And please don't miss the panel discussion featuring these innovators for 2013. I guarantee you'll find the opportunity to get inside their minds very intriguing. And on behalf of Dr. Dessler and all of our innovators, I thank you all for attending today, and we look forward to greeting you at the reception later. Thank you so much.